thank you to all of you here in the room and others who are perhaps watching from elsewhere for the honor you give me by simply listening. Um, and thank you um, uh, to uh, Jeffrey in the Henry Center for the invitation and to uh, Matt and Joel and Ian and Heather and enormous generosity and hospitality they and uh, Trinity has offered me these past days. So I'm going to jump in just uh, and begin with a few words about myself, but I think in doing so, I will be speaking for at least some others as well. Uh, and it's just an observation. When you turn 60 or so, your mind turns to certain questions. And perhaps that's because it's around this age that you see people you know, including friends you may love, dying more frequently. Now, it's not so much that you start asking yourself, what does my life work add up to? That's a perennial question, which I imagine graduate students also ask themselves. But you start wondering more deeply, what does my life itself add up to? Or, or, or better yet, what adds up to my life? And you're sort of suddenly thrust back to the angst of when you were 16 years old, wondering who you are, except that now, at the 60-plus age you are, uh, you are doing so with a host of accumulated contours and shadows coloring the question. But what I want to stress in simply mentioning this is that the question itself is not only very natural, it's an obvious question to ask. And in fact, my remarks today fall into the genre of what one could call uh, apologetics by truism. In this case, insisting on the undeniable in the face of positivistic worries over the Christian faith, such that stating the obvious might constitute, especially in our obscured era, a little epiphany. I'm going to assert what I consider three obvious things, all three of which are also fundamental Christian claims. The first truism is that we all have selves. Each of us is a self, a definite and particular creature. Even Buddhists believe this practically, though they may not like or approve of having selves. But their whole outlook is an attempt to deal with them. Now, I'm not actually going to engage this first truism today, but simply presume it. The second truism which I will discuss is that our selves are hopelessly obscured. This also is a Christian claim, I think. And finally, I will address, thirdly, the obvious fact that we have selves, but that they are hopelessly obscure, and if that's the case, their stability, their definiteness, must be granted them from elsewhere than from the self itself. The Christian claim regarding the second Adam is a version of this obvious truism. So, each of us has a self, and I, as I said, I take this as a given. So let's begin, rather, with the second truism regarding the hopelessly obscured self that we, in fact, have. Consider the case of Ermgard Furkner. Last month, the newspapers were, at least briefly, caught up with the story of this aged German woman who, now at 96 years old, lives in a home for the elderly. She had been recently identified as the same woman who, when she was 18 and 19, worked as the secretary to a Nazi camp superintendent, Paul Werner Hoppe, at the Stutthof concentration camp in the Baltic. She was now being charged with, quote, aiding and abetting the murder of 11,000 persons. And she did this by being, quote, tasked with reading, sorting and writing letters and telegrams on Hoppe's behalf, as well as sending radio transmissions, unquote. The story made the news because Ferkner had somehow escaped her old age home before the trial and gone on the run whatever that means for a 96-year-old woman. OK, so how do we define Ferkner's identity as a person who is criminally liable? 
She is, in fact, and I, she was found and brought back, and the trial started last week, I believe. She is, in fact, being tried as a juvenile, given that she was a teenager during her time at the camp. What is the obvious that one might say about this case? What is the truism at work here? The legal system has its own ways that I would not necessarily question, but one wonders what is going on really at the root of Ferkner, now almost 100 years old, who was a legal juvenile at the time of her alleged crimes. What did she understand about what was happening? Who explained it to her and how? What did the numbers mean to her that were listed on the sheets that crossed her desk? How was she formed to recognize the persons behind these marks? Criminal cases that deal with intent and responsibility get into this difficult realm all the time. What are we to make of James Holmes, the movie theater shooter who in 2012 killed 12 persons at a cinema in Aurora, Colorado? It's an event that crossed my mind recently when I learned that my daughter and son-in-law had just bought a house nearby. Holmes escaped the death penalty because one juror felt that his, quote, mental health mitigated his responsibility. But in fact, Holmes was never declared legally insane, a condition defined in Colorado according to broad categories like, quote, defectivity. Was he defective? In Canada, people can now take their own lives, or rather have doctors take it for them, if they meet the criterion, among others, of mental, quote, competency. What goes into this distinction between defectivity and competency? Where do each of us fall on this spectrum? And how might we or anybody else know? The fact that there are multiple legal standards for all of this, that vary from place to place, and that individuals and groups dispute them, only points to a deeper problem. We don't really know what constitutes the self any self, do we? Can philosophers measure it? This is obvious, and it's the obvious thing that I want to state up front. We are made up of, shaped by, a bewildering host of realities, forces, feelings, experiences, many from without us, some from within, most masked from us and from others. How might anyone know the self? out of the miasma of the world in which we live. St. Paul himself raises a question without answering it when he speaks in Romans 7 of the fact that what I would, that I do not, and what I hate, that is what I do. His final cry in this passage, who will deliver me from the body of this death, is itself given an answer, but an answer offered in the face of an otherwise wrenching aporia. Priests, who are experienced with the confessional face the impenetrability of this reality all the time. And our attempts at engaging it have not so much answered anything as in their diversity confirm the question's irresolvability. Is it genes? Will therapy sort it out? Shall we defer simply if confusedly to the social accidents, determinations, and outcomes of those born here and not there? of those who are rich or who are poor, who are black or who are white, with this proclivity and desire and not another. Parents agonize over this uncertainty in the face of their children's inexplicable tendencies all the time, as do whole societies grappling, grappling with unending conflict, which I need hardly remind anybody here on this regard. The great German phenomenologist Martin Heidegger was among the most acute at engaging this question. It is our unconscious lives, movements, encounters, he argued, not anything we can clearly identify that constitute the ground of our existence as we actually live it, and indeed make up the bulk of the reality that forms us. His famous application of the hammer example goes to this. The hammer comes to us, it's there for our use, as it were, and both the hammer and its object, say a nail for hanging a picture, each has a history. 
as do I, who use the hammer at this point in time. But it turns out to be a very complex history with respect to themselves as present objects. Where did they come from? Who made them? Who transported them? Who sold them? How did they get here to me? And what did it take with respect to the energies and choices of my life that I bought them at the Home Depot at this point of time and have brought them home and have now taken them up in my hands? Their histories are complex as well with respect to their purposes. Who invented the hammer and the nail? How and to what end? What problems, what struggles, what thoughts went into that process? Where and when and through what circumstances? And finally, they have a complex history with respect to our taking hold of them and putting them to work right now. How did, how did we learn how to use a hammer? Under what circumstances and why at this point in time? For us, knowledge of a reality comes immediately from our use of it. But these are narrow, these moments and uses. They shift, and in all this, they conceal far more than they reveal. It is obvious that we are unconscious, indeed mostly ignorant, of any of this. Right now, I take up the hammer and nail and use it to fasten a hook on which to hang a picture. That's really all that I know, and perhaps all I need to know. Now, Heidegger's example is banal, and it's meant to be. After all, who cares about the hammer and the nails? Well, we could say the craftsman, I do, just now. But thus, a moment's reflection on the banality of this life moment underscores its hidden complexity. Instead, these objects appear to me only in my use of them just now, but the bulk of their actual reality lies hidden to me. And the realities of self are a little different if yet more, infinitely more, complex. And this obscure complexity becomes the challenging, even often the frightening foundation of my existence. I am a bundle of world realities of which I am mostly unconscious. And my sense of self, or anybody else's sense of myself and I of theirs, emerges from all of this only at rare moments in very restricted ways when I need them, say, and often, therefore, unpredictably, and if acted upon as if that is what they truly all were, in very distorted ways. While Heidegger himself sought ways to stabilize this grandly skeptical view of the self and knowledge of it, grandly skeptical, skeptical it was, a skepticism embracing uh, even the social and physical sciences to which we often turn for answers about these questions. And based on a kind of recognition of the self's infinitely ordered and infinitely ungraspable makeup. Now, my point is we have always known this and we have intuited it, certainly, like St. Paul. The rise of an anthropology of the unconscious in the later 19th century, whether negatively like Freud, or more positively, like William James, was fueled in part by the sense of inadequacy we all hold, that the self's hidden complexities seem to generate for us, but a sense that has been long-standing. In an earlier age, for instance, the realm of spirits was plied. Dreams and visions might offer insight uh, into the hidden self. And then, leaving that behind, came an era of exploration of desire, by moralists of every kind, working away within the inner quarters of the soul, tugging, driving, pulling away, and then disappearing into the internal mists. Only after these frustrating efforts came the so-called empirical study of cognitive processes, whether from Freud and in its medical, physical form, the Heideggers of the world, and now the cognitive scientists. Each of these exploratory trajectories, intellectually, unveiled more and more of the secretive forces that shape the self, but in doing so only rendered less and less clear what the self might actually be. Are they ethereal beings? Distorted pressures of heart and society? Thousands of unremarked yet formative encounters with the world, each receding into the endless chain of generation? Are they chemicals rushing in and out and through the hidden resource recesses of our tissues, and then simply the constantly changing world that marks our living forms among and towards other arcane selves, each forming their own worlds as they refashion ours. 
We do not belong to ourselves, quite literally. Take away the world, take away other human beings and their worlds, most of which we do not know about, let alone understand, and we disappear. I can think of no more important natural moral claim we could make about personal reality. All the legal and medical and ethical templates we might apply to a human being are but stopgap measures to avoid falling into a paralyzing abyss of shrouded ignorance about what owns us. They are but pragmatic fictions, you could say, whose use we discover over and over again can be as destructive as it is sometimes facilitating, from the so-called competency beside, behind self-murder to the defective calculus of killing others. There's a contemporary word drawn from modern physics that has become popular in metaphorically describing all of this. The word is entanglement, as in the entangled self. The scientific origin of this metaphor is important, for it implies that such entanglement is physically grounded, and that we can recognize its incomprehensibility simply by counting up and projecting the various relationships of a human person to its history and context, and even its material context. These eventually expand without measurable end. Philosophy exhausts itself in the face of such entanglement, but entanglement is also religiously problematic, since the entangled self must, by definition, lose any recognizable integrity. The struggle by individuals and societies to maintain a scientific vision and a defined religious commitment at the same time has generally been a losing one in the contemporary era. And those who have explored entanglement as a theological vision, in our day most of all, have usually ended up as materialist pantheists at best. The divine self, in the face of its empirical obscurity, is either an arbitrary, and often tyrannically arbitrary, construction, or rationally Promethean, we might say, or it is simply gobbled up by something else, energy, matter, spirit. They are two sides of the same coin. So the social dangers involved then in adopting an entangled view of the self are extreme, Heidegger himself being an exemplar. His sophisticated search for the conscious self through an ascetically voluntarist erasure of the inauthentic, from his point of view anyway, in fact ended by giving the self over to other forces, because one quickly discovers you can't do it all on your own. In this case, in his case, National Socialism and its ideologies, whose character proved overwhelming. Our identification in the West of modernity's challenge, liberalism's high valuing of individualism and autonomy, much discussed, may itself in this light be a misinterpretation. Is not our liberal culture's assertion of the self's liberty nothing but a reaction to the spread of confusion and anxiety about the self in the face of its perceived dilution into the sea of unharnessed influences and claims. We are all trying to define competency and defectivity, you could say, all the time. But the more we know about ourselves, the less we are able to do so. The search for the true me is always done under the shadow of the voracious and unknown other and its infinite number of siblings. The shift in our current public policies to prioritizing the collective and the systemic is both comprehensive across the political spectrum today and rightly unsettling to many. The search for autonomy by the entangled self seems to lead inexorably to a self-discovery as a collective submersion, two sides of the same anxiety. As I said in opening these remarks, I want, to, I want to stress how Christian normalcy fits the character of the world as we know it. I want to state the obvious. There's a long scriptural history of the unknown self, if we but pause to note it. The garden, where neither Adam nor Eve seem to have a clue as to the forces that shape their desires and choices. 
Cain and Abel, caught up in the violence of a sin that lies, we are told, crouching at the door, present yet unseen. And on we could go, one story after another, of moral confusion and motivational mystery. So that when Jeremiah calls the human heart deceitful above all things, literally crooked and intricate, as in the crooked valleys that will be made straight in Isaiah 40, Jeremiah is not only describing the nature of the self within the turbulent sphere of 6th century Judah and the Near East, but summarizing an entire divine tradition that judges Socrates' exhortation to know yourself irrelevant. The judgment of the self's opacity is lodged in both the Old and the New Testaments. Who knows the secrets of the human heart, Solomon asks. And his answer, only God himself. Quote, for thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of the children of men. It's 1 Kings 8. So there is a self. You and I have selves. But God only knows what it is. And it's important to get this basic claim right. Only God knows myself, ourselves. For if, as some Christians have supposed from time to time, more frequently in modernity, if the divine knowledge of the self is viewed as somehow transferred to a human spiritual capacity or faculty, we are simply thrust back into the spiral of lostness. Once made into a pneumatic principle of Gnostic exploration, the claim to have access to the inner workings of the self via the spirit, say, has usually opened the door to the rushing forces of oceanic possession. And this temptation lies behind much modern religiosity, with its willingness to be carried along, submerged, lifted up, and taken down all at once until we disappear into some one great movement or entropy of devouring unrelatedness. The stillness of, quote, everything and nothing together, as Schopenhauer put it. This is one version of the modern cosmological narrative, which in fact many religious people have taken as their own. Perhaps this is where the scientist as religious believer most frequently ends up, I don't know. But none of this is obvious, nor is this the Christian claim. The Christian claim about the self is only God, and it works itself out in a clear fashion. So, there is then the first relevant Christian claim states, one Adam, the first Adam, in whom, granted a contested translation, we have all toppled into the abyss of the self's infinite regressive identity with its terrible gravitational pull. One can try to parse the claim metaphorically in terms of history or more recently genetic makeup, but claim it remains. There is also the second claim, astounding in its way. That is, that there is a second Adam, the one man who holds all these entangled influences within himself, a true self, just him, defined in relation to all others and from whom all ourselves in some way flow. This second Adam is absolutely and exhaustively joined to the infinity of hidden truths, events, constitutions, influences that overwhelm our own individual beings, at least as far as we can know them. But this second claim I am suggesting is almost a logical consequence of the first. Given the nature of the self, only God can know and hold together in some kind of integrity the infinite range of the world's particularities as such and as intrinsically other bound. The logical aspect of this claim was most keenly argued by the early modern philosopher Leibniz whose groundbreaking work on suffering and evil, theodicy, a word he coined, was founded on the conviction that only the perfect God could order infinite relations in a way that made, at some transcendent level, divine sense. And Leibniz thought this could be done in a manner that might be expressed as a kind of divine mathematics. Only God 
can grasp every thread of our entanglements and their knots. Leibniz's logic has only recently been recognized in its proper human domain. It is just in the past few years, literally. Herbert Simon first raising these issues only in the 1950s. That economists, for instance, studying the long-standing rational and mathematical models that have founded economic theory and practice for centuries, have faced the fact that human beings individually and thus collectively do not, in fact, act rationally. Given the complexity of economic behavior, this basic fact renders understanding and modeling itself a, quote, intractably fallible enterprise. The so-called geometric thinking of scientists whom Pascal, who I'll come back to, derided for misapplying to the human heart, and that Edmund Burke shuddered at saying bandied about by the French revolutionaries. This geometric thinking is nothing but the unveiled incapacity of human ingenuity seeking to manipulate social existence and to follow the infinite threads that shape ourselves and any other self there might be, and thereby making the worst mess possible. Leaving Leibniz's logic aside, though, you can see, I hope, where the claim about the two atoms must go. Only a God-man can be a man of integrity, in Heidegger's term, a truly and absolutely authentic self, not only for himself, but for us, pro nobis. Jesus becomes our unconscious and our world, both, from whom emerges and is revealed the self we are to know, grasp, grow, engage, and share. Without the God-man, whose infinitely perfect and clarifying penetration of our obscure and complexly hidden identities is their only light, we are each left in the vortex of personal and collective unknowing and its disabling maw. We would all be 60-year-olds without answers. While there were certainly differences, some quite deep, between Eastern and Western theologians in determining the mechanism, as it were, by which Adam and Christ, the first Adam and the second Adam, each touch the breadth of, our, of the whole human race, matters relating, for instance, to how human uh, freedom might be involved, all Christians were agreed that somehow Christ took on the fullness of human being in such a way as affects all of us. Whether one speaks of nature or species or genus, it was understood by all that the breadth of human complexity, one that is after all embodied in a way that stretches across time and space for each of us, was assumed by Christ somehow. And this all seemed obvious to Christians. Now, I should note some worries that developed around the two-atom perspective. Worries fueled by the paradigm's formative role in Jewish and Christian mysticism, and finally Gnosticism itself that reached a flowering in the Kabbalism of both groups in late medieval and early modern periods. I bring this up because there have been good and bad ways of applying the two-atom framework. The bad, in my view, Gnostic way, included the likes of little-known figures except to specialists like Mercury von Helmont and his many epigones and embraced Quakers and a raft of marginal figures, but also others quite influence, influential in their the cultural imagination, like William Blake. Figures like these ended up tarring the two Adams framework with suspicion. And hence, despite its venerable orthodoxy, the framework has become marginal in much daily Christian thinking in our era. Attractions to and worries over the Gnostic inflation of the two atoms is a version of the double-sided anxiety that hovers around liberty and collectivism within modernity. I would only suggest that the historical counterweight to these tendencies is, and always has been, the scriptural text itself. The defense against the slide into Gnostic rediscoveries of singularity through self-denying collectivism lies in the particularities of the scriptural history. And this history constitutes, I would suggest, a quasi-metaphysical claim. 
The self we struggle with and do not know is all the old Adam, the first Adam, that dissolves in the mist of history and genetics and blaming and guilt. Can I say this? It is because the first Adam is the Adam of our this-worldly selves, our fallen selves, that we have so much trouble in our biblical historical disciplines even knowing who he is, this first Adam. And our arguments are impossibly tortured with respect to creation and evolution, time, cause and effect. The argument itself is a sign of our impossibly realizable selves as they are, wandering into the forests of the indistinguishable unconscious of past and present. Metaphysically, the first atom is lost to us. By contrast, we are who we are particularly because of the one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And we will become who we are meant to be in our particularity, called by name, as we hear over and over again in Scripture, because of him as well. This truly is a mystery, but a very concrete one. Only that which is revealed from among the infinity of truths about the world and about each of us, Jesus of Nazareth, constitutes the ground for our particularity. We do not know who we shall be, but we shall be like him, somehow, as John says in his first epistle. Only a second Adam, the particular historical embodiment of the infinitely wise and perfect God. Infinity joined to perfection, not just imperfection, coincident and identical, the God-man. Only he can reveal to us our divinely purposed self. This is why scripture contains both history and law, narrative and morals and exhortation. The one thing is ordered to our thing and my thing, both, as a sign and means that the self is given by God truly, but only through his own self-determination in Jesus Christ. Just here, just now, doing this and not that, but with an eternal validity. In other words, the tag, how odd of God to choose the Jews, is the only metaphysical basis upon which our lives have any meaning in human terms. God becomes particular. Israel, law, scripture. God becomes man, a man, this man, Jesus, the perfect man, so that man may have the particular self as he and she was made to have. So there is clearly a first Adam whom we do not know, nor do we know his progeny, that is, ourselves. And that is why there clearly must be a second Adam, because obviously we do have a self. The Word made flesh, who takes all of us and lays it bare to God, and in so doing takes all that we are from God and presents it to us. Put differently, we do not know who we are, we only see Jesus, as Hebrews puts it, as given us in the scriptures and their open-ended ordering of our consciousness which turns to contain our breadth and multitudes. I began with the rather disturbing and certainly perplexing examples of Ermgard Ferkner and James Holmes. But what of the case of the second Adam's revelation of the self in just the way I have hinted at now, as his own coming to us and then taking us along paths of particular action, events, practices, laws, forgivenesses, trustings, dyings even, that in just this following we could say untangle us, draw us out of the infinity of our unknown threads and place us within, weave us into the tangible fabric of his scriptural known life. Are there case studies, as it were, of Christian selfhood bound to the Christ of scripture that reveal the goodness God has given us as selves? And the answer is, of course there are. There are multitudes of them. So I will give you two. One, an intellectually celebrated example. Another, quite unknown, yet very common. Let's take the famous case first, that of Blaise Pascal, the, if you will, intellectual Mozart of the 17th century France. 
genius mathematician, physicist, literary stylist, psychologist, finally theologian, dying at age 39 in 1662. Pascal's Pensées, that collection of notes and a few longer essays that were discovered after his death, were the unfinished preparation for a book on Christian apologetics he was preparing. This unfinished apology constitutes the record of just this kind of journey of disentanglement that Christianity rightly locates in the second Adam. There's a lot going on in the Pensées, of course, but one of them is Pascal's dissection of the self's incapacity to know itself in any clear or stable way, even remotely. The famous section called On the Disproportion of Man speaks to this openly, with Pascal um, in an almost Leibnizian way, but with a heart in this case, which Leibniz didn't seem to have much of, drawing on the logic of natural infinities and causation to simply but starkly lay bare our incapacity to grasp ourself and its identity. Whether one looks outward towards the universe and its expanse and its physical sets, or inwards towards the microscopic or finely particle components and their purposes and energies, Pascal says it is all a whirl of infinite relations that because we find ourselves inexplicably in the midst of them, cloak our understandings with a fearful and impenetrable gloom. I think many of you know some of the marvelous phrases of this passage, which I'll simply quote now. If man made himself the first object of study, he would see how incapable he is of going further. How can a part know the whole? But he may perhaps aspire to know at least the parts to which he bears some proportion. But the parts of the world are all so related and linked to one another that I believe it impossible to know one without the other and without the whole. Man, for instance, is related to all he knows. He needs a place wherein to abide, time through which to live, motion in order to live, elements to compose him, warmth and food to nourish him, air to breathe. He sees light, he feels bodies, in short, he is in a dependent alliance with everything. To know man, then, it is necessary to know how it happens that he needs air to live. And to know the air, we must know how it is thus related to the life of man. Etc. Flame cannot exist without air, therefore to understand the one, one must understand the other. Since everything then is cause and effect, dependent and supporting, mediate and immediate, and all is held together by a natural, though imperceptible, chain which binds together things most distant and most different, I hold it equally impossible to know the parts without knowing the whole, and to know the whole without knowing the parts in detail, but of course one cannot know any of this. So he speaks of the, quote, eternal silence of these infinite spaces, unquote, both extended and inverted spaces, without and within, and they, he writes, fill me with dread. To this blunt ignorance, the wisdom of God, as he puts it, says to us, quote, only I can make you understand what you are. And then Pascal jots right next to this claim, Adam, comma, Jesus Christ. And Pascal will play off this pairing at various points throughout the Pensees. But the fullest comment is in an unrelated text that was not part of the notes for the Apology, but discovered only 200 years later, and today known as, quote, the mystery of Jesus, which you may be familiar with as a particularly famous passage. This text by Pascal, though, is but a long list of aspects of Jesus' passion. Jesus suffers. Jesus seeks comfort. He is alone, he is abandoned, he is kind, he prays, he asks, he is weary, and so on. Pascal lists each one in order, and he marks each of these phrases and events, each with a short quotation from the Gospels. In the middle of this list, Pascal writes this, quote, Jesus is in the garden, not of delight, like the first Adam, who there feels and took with him all mankind, but of agony, where he has saved himself 
and all mankind. And then this is then followed by that very famous phrase of Pascal's, Jesus will be in agony until the end of the world. But at issue is, as I've been suggesting, the obvious way in which the second Adam must comprehend all that we cannot about ourselves. And so the list, as he puts it, each aspect of Jesus' life is somehow for Pascal taking up in an inclusive way that which to us is but a gnarled ball of knots into which the first Adam has entangled us. Indeed, one might argue that the whole project of Pascal's apology, for which the pensées were the ingredients, is to lay out the logic of the second Adam's establishment of ourselves that have otherwise been lost in the infinite maze of natural phenomena and their infinitely regressive explication. We can find firmness, stability, in the infinitely inclusive particularity of Jesus, the God-man, the second Adam, who alone can comprehend all of this and provide a foothold above the opening abyss, as he puts it, of our floating selves. It always dismays students who pick up the pensées for the first time to realize that the bulk of this very famous volume by Pascal turns out to be made up of quotes and comments on bare scriptural verses, nothing more. Just as it is a surprise for those who know Pascal's wager argument, the most famous part of the pensées, only in the form of the gambling probabilities, betting on the infinite God who brings by definition more probable winnings than betting on the non-entity of an opaque self cast into the midst of an inert cosmos. It comes as a surprise to students to discover that the discourse on the wager immediately continues with an exhortation simply to go through the motions of the Christian life. Go and attend mass, he says. Go and say the prayers. That, according to Pascal, constitutes the probable bet one should make. For after all, what makes us infinitely complicated is a labyrinth of our motivational passions. But by contrast, the habits, the motions of a scriptural life alone, bound, so the argument goes to the life of Jesus, the second Adam, only that can elucidate who we are. Pascal's entire apology was based, as it were, on this insight that Adam gives himself over to the second Adam. And he, Pascal, or any person thus given over, has found him or herself only there as God's own. To move much more briefly to a contemporary and, if you will, quotidian case, quotidian at least in Africa, I sit on the board of a small Christian organization that promotes sexual abstinence outside of marriage and that initially organized its work in East Africa in the face of the AIDS HIV pandemic that began some decades ago. The work is led by local young people who visit secondary schools and give presentations to the students, answer questions, provide a space for testimonies and the rest. I've accompanied them on a few times, and once in Uganda, met and heard a young girl, perhaps 15 years old, give her testimony after making a commitment to abstinence. She had begun the session, however, by asking the leaders, and here we were talking about a, we're talking about a public discussion in front of dozens and dozens of her peers. She asked, what can I do, and then explains. She was in tears, explaining the whole dilemma she found herself in. Her dependence on her uncle's money to pay for her rural school fees and school equipment and the sexual demands her uncle made on her in return. And then a young teacher's similar demands while in school in order to forestall poor grades and thus expulsion. And these were sexual demands to which she, however forcibly, finally assented. And so she stood there weeping before this gathered group. Several of her classmates sniggered, as if her plight was obvious to solve, because it had been, they thought, obvious enough to have stayed away from. But surely, even we, sitting here at such a distance, can see how much more complicated it is than that. And there are, after all, and rightly, 
social scientists, political researchers and psychologists who haven't continued to study just such events of familial, economic, and sexual coercion. They work for private groups, for the UN, for universities, for churches. With her peers, they have their own theories about how this kind of thing can happen. Uncles trading money for sex with their nieces and teachers doing the same. Who shall we say this young girl is in all of this? She is made up of a host of forces, after all. The desire for education in a desperate context, the search for learning, the predations of uncle and teacher, male and female relations of power, economic, social structure, and on and on and on. We look on this perhaps and say, what a sorry situation. But yes, a situation that draws on the breadth of this young girl's family, village, time, place, home, money, desires, friends, hormones, commercial systems, political orderings, clothing, mind, demands. The question of the first Adam is the question of all social and scientific, social scientific investigation. And like all such investigations, this first Adam question is unending and unendable. By the close of the afternoon, however, this and that had unfolded. There were presentations, there were prayers, and the rest. The girl stands up finally to give her testimony, emerging from this fretful turmoil of discussion and examination. Jesus told her, she said to all of us just now, he told her just now, just in these conversations, perhaps less clearly for some time now, Jesus told her, come to me, he said, and I will give you rest. If you love me, keep my commandments, he told her. She was, of course, quoting two well-known Bible verses that she already knew. But she went on, I have decided to speak to my pastor and to resist my uncle and my teacher, come what may. And then she said clearly, that is who I am. And she began to cry. But with a declaratory voice, she said these words, that took the hundreds of other young people listening aback. Now, this is not an unusual story. That's the point. Even Augustine recounts how a converting voice told him to take up and read. And he happened to have some good mentors in Christian communities who led him. So first of all, the girl's witness that I observed was one simply of straightforward advice given to her by those with whom she spoke. This is what Jesus says, go, uh, go and do this, go talk to so-and-so, don't do that, here's how this can work, here's someone else in the same boat, etc. And secondly, it was also a simple conversion story of sorts. But either way, my point is that it is now herself that she has found in him. All ourselves are there. And if this were not so, ourselves are simply lost in oblivion. Those who turn their face away from the second Adam have turned away from their own self. There is more to redemption, redemption from sin itself, than this turn, but it is all related. And in bringing up these examples, I want to be clear about the nature of the self that the second Adam has embraced. It is not the case that the infinitely entangled self that is ours is a not to be discarded in Christ and then replaced by something reductively distilled. The self's infinity is itself beautiful in the end, the end here being God's mysterious design. Here Leibniz is right. Our selves are the best of all possible selves, whatever else they may be. The fact that we ourselves cannot know them by ourselves is not a negation of the selves we have or a cynical consignment of all ourselves to the darkened abyss of uh, Imgard, Ferkner, and James Holmes, or perhaps even them to such an unending disappearance. The, se thus the second advent does not simply uh, simplify ourselves, but rather he explicates them perfectly. So Athanasius in his letter to Marcellinus. The Lord himself is in the words of scripture. And he writes in summary, for I think that in the words of this book of Psalms, all human life is covered with all its states and thoughts and that nothing further can be found in man. 
For no matter what you seek, whether it be repentance or confession, help in trouble, temptation, other persecution, whether you have been set free from plots and snares or on the contrary are sad for any reason, whether you have uh, seeing yourself progressing and your enemy cast down, you want to praise and thank and bless God. Each of these things, the divine psalms show you how to do. And in every case, the words you want are written down for you and you can say them as your own. And that is because the psalms describe the Lord Jesus Christ first of all. And he then describes you in himself. Thus, the human study of the self is not without purpose. It's not all wrong. One can fruitfully engage the Heideggers and the geneticists of our culture. But they are only small sketchers and watercolorists in a field of grand design that surpasses their skills, not just by a large amount, but infinitely. It is true, furthermore, that just as the economists have done great harm in projecting their limited rational designs onto the intractable infinity of human or rational commercial intercourse, the phenomenologists, psychologists, and genesis, geneticists, and even many theolo theological moralists have done terrible damage to the reverencing of God's creative mystery of the self, and thus have created selves themselves by insisting that what are only at best elusive sketches stand for the thing in itself. In the second Adam, what awaits us as heirs of the first is the final unveiling and experience of the self as an infinitely complexly ordered yet singular gift. The vision of Christ in heaven as both a song and a song joined to the pleroma of creatures who praise now just the manifested infinities of divine createdness. But for all this, for all my technical blather, I want to stress again, it's a completely normal way to grasp the Christian gospel's articulation of normalcy itself. One that phenomenologists, psychologists, economists, and criminologists all intuit, yet have shrunk, it seems, from admitting. The point is not purely apologetic. The normalcy of the Christian faith is important to stress in the midst of a world and society that has lost itself in the shadowed recesses of selves it can no longer identify. To this, the Christian says, here I am, lo, I have come to do your will, because Christ Jesus, the second Adam, speaks this on our behalf. This is the gift of stability the second Adam both signifies and brings into the world of selves. Thank you.